Hi, everyone. It's Ken Rakowski, and this is Metal Mentoring, where we take one of, generally, it's one of the metal members, and we learn from them what it takes to take us to a different level. This person today, I'm honored to have on, literally honored, because when I first met him from Richard Bangs introduced me to him. Richard, of course, created the Adventure Travel segment. I met Tom, and Tom was just a humble individual, and then I went and, and I Googled him, and First, his Wikipedia, or excuse me, his IMDb goes on for years and years and years. Tom has been behind the camera. His voice has been through your speakers. He, uh, he is somebody that knows how to take us for a journey and uh, keeps suspense going all the time. Of course, some of his shows you would know from Ice Truckers, Storage Wars, Deadliest Catch, and the list goes on and on and on. Tom has really changed the way unscripted television, unscripted storytelling is, and it's a great honor to have him here with us. Let's give it all up for Mr. Tom Beers. Hello, Tom. Unmute yourself, my friend. I did. How you doing, man? Hey, Tom. So when we, when we say unscripted, because that's the term, unscripted just means reality, right? Oh, well, yeah, it does, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I prefer Obstock. You know, I mean, observation uh, documentaries are kind of, it's a little different. I mean, it, you know, the shows that I make aren't usually formatted shows. They really are kind of follow doc. And I just follow people in their lives. And, and luckily, I've, over the years, it, it's been an amazing journey. I, I, you know, I work with a lot of, you know, tough men doing tough jobs. That's pretty much been my life for a long time. I mean, lumberjacks, oil rig workers, coal miners, fishermen, lobster fishermen, crab fishermen, um, you know, truck drivers. So that it, it runs the gamut of all kind of tough jobs. So if you go back to your early 20s, and mm -hmm. I would show you an image of you at the age you're at now going, Tom, this is who you're going to become. Would you believe it? <laughs> well, I'm first of all, glad I'm still alive. <laughs> oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> you know, that's good. And, I mean, I, I, looking at myself, I mean, no, I, to be honest with you, I, I, it sucks getting older. I don't like, to, I, I look old. I don't like that. But, you know, my, the body of sense. work in my life has been, you know, it's been extraordinary. I, I have absolutely zero complaints. I mean, you know, I, you have to understand, I, I, I started this career uh, in, in this, this business because I just, I had a massive kind of a, a, a dose of wanderlust. I, I just you know, I found an opportunity, a way to go out and explore every parts of the world and the universe, you know, uh, and, and have somebody else pay for it. So that was really my journey. <laughs> yeah, but Tom, let's go back. Um, life in the early days of Tom Beers wasn't necessarily easy, was it? You, well, early, early days, not. Look, I came from really, you know, some from, you know, to be honest, I was a poor kid. I mean, we had nothing. I had... Uh, you know, a, a kind of a divorced family and, um, you know, kind of my mom worked two jobs and uh, I pretty much took care of myself and from the age of 14, 15, worked my way, went into college. I, I worked my way through six and a half years of college as a janitor, um, you know, and uh, then lived went on to food stamps? Lived, huh? on food stamps? lived on food stamps, lived on food stamps. Yeah. Lived on not just food stamps. Yeah. Back then you actually got these really kind of interesting uh, army surplus foods you know, from World War II and the Korean War. So there are these big, huge cans of mystery meat. I know, maybe pork, might have been beef, but I don't know, it was just loaded with fat and huge blocks of uh, U.S. Army surplus cheese. And, you know, so that's kind of what we, we lived off of for a long time. So, yeah, it, you know, times are tough. And, um, you know, luckily they're not anymore. <laughs> and, and someone mentioned before we hit record was that you went to uh, acting school. Oh, I was an actor for years. You know, I, I heard that uh, the comment. Uh, I, I, you know, I studied. I, I was an actor. I was a director. I was a playwright. Um, I, I worked for and studied with the great teachers in New York. I, I studied with Uta Hagen, Stella Adler, uh, and Lee Strasberg. And then I had the privilege also of working for Lee Strasberg um, for uh, three years uh, and studying with him too. But I worked with him up in his house. So. Uh, you know, I had a lot of private time with Lee to kind of talk about stuff. You know, let me tell you something. The one thing that's interesting, if you ask what a, what a real connective thing is to metal now, is that I was very fortunate over the years to have incredible mentors, you know, and Strasburg was one of those. I mean, he was the, one of the first ones I had. And then there were playwrights. I had John Guar, 
and uh, you know, there, uh, uh, David uh, Rabe uh, were, were good friends and they were mentors early on, George Firth. And then um, when I moved to, uh, to, to Turner Broadcasting, Ted Turner was an extraordinary mentor to me. Uh, and then, you know, getting out here, I, Peter Goober, uh, was an amazing mentor to me uh, and uh, it Bert Van Munster who we mentored each other but you know so I've just been fortunate over my my life to find really you know interesting people who have been very successful to kind of help me along the way the journey yeah it's true but what made you want to pick up a camera what was that catalyst to say you know I'm going to be on the other side of this oh dude you know you want the real crazy on yes. un story is this is that I know but this is a crazy one when I was 12 years old, my mom was dating a writer. His name was Alan Silito. He was British. He was one of the young British writers. I think he wrote uh, uh, All the Pretty Horses. And he wrote these incredible books. But he was one of the angry young British writers from the 60s and 70s. And he had just come back from Safari. I like the way the Brits say it. Safari, not Safari. Safari. Uh, I used to work with Attenborough, and that's the way he called it, too. But... Um, and also Cousteau. I mean, so I had a lot of mentors. Anyway, so this guy says to me, he hands me a National Geographic from 1961. And he says, if, uh, no, 63. He says, hey, if he can do it, you can do it. I have no idea what he's talking about. I go through the normal National Geographic and, you know, the pictures and stuff. And I had the book for about, I don't know, a month or so. And then for some reason, I'm looking at the masthead of the National Geographic magazine. And the, the vice president, president of production, his name was Thomas Beers. He had the same exact name as me. And I'm like, and he said that, remember, he said to me, if he can do it, you can do it. So it stuck in my head. So imagine a kid, 12, 13 years old, flash forward 20 years, I'm 30, 32 years old, and I'm sitting at National Geographic as the executive producer of National Geographic. So that was, that was, the, that was the, the, the impetus to push me into that direction. It was like, and so anything after that that occurred, I kept going, I wanna do that, I wanna be that Tom Beers. Wow, but you had to pick up a camera at one point in time between 12 and 32 to say, I'm going to start shooting. Yeah, something. but I picked up, no, but yeah, but it, again, I, I believe in process. And in life is a process, life is a journey. And I learned camera, I learned directing. Look, I, I, I learned story arcs, character arcs. I, I looked, uh, you know, dramatic arcs. I learned all that from the theater, you know, as an actor. And I took and applied all of that to my nonfiction work which is why my nonfiction work early on, it broke through the clutter because people are going, what is this guy doing that's so different? I really understood. I took what you would have in a normal three acts play and I put it over a five act structure for television so with, with character, with, 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 with um, cliffhangers. So for each of the bumps, I mean, I really understood how to basically break an act. And that was one of the big things, plus also character development, story development, and again, that, all that stuff. I, I learned that early. But camera work came later. I was broke in New York as an actor, and a buddy of mine was a commercial director. And he got me my first job as a PA working in commercials. So then for about four years, I worked in the commercial industry. I, and I worked my way up to become a producer. I produced a lot of McDonald's, uh, uh, Ford uh, Motor Company commercials, a lot of general food commercials. So I did a, a whole bunch. And funnily enough, this is, a, you know, your life, I just always kind of look at these kind of moments in my life. And at the time, this is 1980. 94, 94, yeah, 1985, 86, and it was Christmas, and I had, I was in the middle of the worst love affair of my life, I had this girl, it was just, we were just fighting all the time, we'd fight and fuck, you know, if that was pretty much it, it was like this incredible passion, incredible, but then we'd fight all the time, and it was awful, and at the same time, I produced three TV commercials in that November, I produced California Pitted Prunes, Scott Toilet Tissue, and Preparation H. My entire career was circling the bowl, and my personal life was in the shitter. So it was just perfect. The symmetry of that was incredible. And then I got a call from Turner Broadcasting, from Ted, from, and saying, hey, look, you want to come? You've been trying to, I've been bugging him for two years. I bugged Turner for a job. Every thing I did. If I did a TV commercial, I sent him a copy of the ta a tape of, of the commercial. If I got any reviews on the plays that I was dire directing or writing, I sent it to him. I sent whatever I could. And finally, it took almost three years. And finally, he called one day and said, and said hey, boy, you want to work for me? Come on down. And that was it.
So persist persistence and consistency of your persistence. Yes, and passion. Super important. Huh? Super yeah. important, those two things. Yeah, they really are. They you are. Know, you've got to think. And Strasburg taught me that. He said, you know what? Strasburg said to me once, he said, he said a bunch of things, but he said to me, he says, Tom, he says, to make it in this business, to make it in any business, business he says, it takes about 10% talent and 90% tenacity. That's yeah. what he said. I think it's in anything, right? Yeah, just stick in there, man. You got to gut it out. By the way, you know, it's still hovering over this conversation is what you said earlier, and I don't want to go into it yet, but you said, I hate getting old. And I, I, I want to hit on that a little later on because I, I get that. And uh, I get that as I get old too. But someone like you, to me, I always look at you, Tom, and I never see your age. Matter of fact, I was shocked the other day because I do know how old you are, but I can't even see you at that age. Because I see you as a 50-year-old, actually like a 40-year-old guy because of what you do. And you think like a young person. You're agile and you, but that's another conversation. Tom, um, let's talk about that big break. That big break was you doing that like one hour show out of Alaska. It was like something was supposed to be short. Just tell us, tell us about what that was, what kind of equipment you brought with, with, with you, what you were expecting and what it turned out to be. Well, you know, this is again, this is in 1998. So this is before the turn of the century. I love saying that, by the way. So before the turn of the century. Um, so I got a commission. I had just left, uh, Paramount flew me to and brought me to LA to do a series called Wild Things with Burt Van Munster, who then went on to create Amazing Race. Yes. And I, I worked with Burt on that one. Um, but Burt and I did a series together. And I did for one year. Now, as a showrunner, and particularly on a lot of new shows, you know, you're hired to be fired. I kind of knew that. And um, so they brought me out here in the first season and I worked my ass off. It was an amazing uh, show. Uh, but it, it just, I, I had a, 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 one of the worst television executives. I, I, I got a segue because this to me is one of the great stories. I worked for Paramount making a show called Wild Things with Burt Van Munster. Um, I, my, I was in, in charge of sending, I was a showrunner. So I had all these crews traveling all over the world, making, uh, these, uh, these short pieces about, you know, uh, animal contact. It was called closer. The tag was closer than you've ever been before, but I've got, I got guys calling me at two in the morning from Malta. You know, I got people calling me from the far east, you know, at three, four in the morning. So I'm, I'm fielding calls all night long from these guys kind of talking about the segments that they're shooting and how, what, what you know, because my thing was all about storytelling and I knew the world very well. Bert and I had traveled the world and knew all these, these camps in Africa and, 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 and in South America and in Asia. We knew the world really well. I'd spent years, decades traveling it. So I'm running this thing. But at the same time, I just moved to LA. I got my wife at the time was about five and a half months pregnant. So all of a sudden, one day, I've got about two and a half months early, Max is born. He's pre born prematurely, my son. So now I'm busting my ass on the show during the day. I'm rushing to the hospital at night. The kid's in the emergency room. My wife's in the emergency room. They're in critical care. I'm, I'm there. And then I go home and try to get some sleep. And I'm getting calls all night long. From my guys so i'm not sleeping i mean i am a mess and I'm, I'm worried about my kid my wife i'll never forget it i get a call from the executive at paramount i get a call into her office her name is clancy collins by the way c-l-a-s anyway clancy collins her name was she was uh and she was the executive from paramount and i thought she was calling me in to say hey man are you okay i know you're going through a tough time so she calls me in her office and she says hey you know um i just want to tell you i'm concerned because your work ethic is really, really slipping. Your work is just slipping. And um, I don't get this whole baby thing. <laughs> and that's what she said. And she used air quotes, air attacks. So she went, this whole baby thing. <laughs> it's like one of those moments where I got introduced to the other side of Hollywood that I never really wanted to know about. And in my head, I ripped her head off. I set fire to her throat. And, and, I mean, I literally, I did mom. all sorts of terrible things and then I, I knew that I was gone at that point that that would be the last first and last season so anyway the reason I bring all that up is so now I step out and my big break 
funnily enough, is being fired. Because then I get a call from, my first call is from a guy named Steve Burns, who at the time was a big executive at Discovery Channel, great guy. And Burns had known me from my years at Turner Broadcasting. He knew I was basically out of work. And he said, look, I got this show, it's called Extreme Alaska. I don't know what it is, but uh, do you want to produce it? And I said, sure, I'd love to. So he sends me all these research and documents that he had, it was a two hour special. And so I, you know, and I'm, and I'm kind of, it's an anthology show. So it's like, okay, it's two hours. I'm going to do a thing about, you know, these mountain climbers, extreme Alaska that were caught on Mount McKinley and they survived this incredible storm, but they lost their fingers and their toes, the frostbite. I'm doing a piece about muskox. I'm doing a piece on volcanoes. And one of the pieces that I'm, I'm going to do is a little thing called, I, I see an article called the deadliest job in the world. So I'm like, huh, crab fishing. Turns out it's the deadliest job in the world. At the time, they had averaged a death a week during the season. So I'm like, fuck, so I'm, I'm gonna go talk myself onto one of these boats. So I literally, me and uh, Scott Simper, uh, there are three of us. We, we basically, we, uh, we talk, I talk our way onto a crab boat, uh, the Fierce Allegiance, and we go out to sea. Wait, 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 Tom, 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 I think you just mentioned something, it's a big deal. You talked yourself to yeah. go on this boat. Yeah, yeah, we went, we flew, we didn't have a, we had no contacts, nothing. And, and they're out in, way out in Dutch Harbor, on an island called Unalaska, out in the middle of the Aleutians. I fly there with my crew. I got no, you got nothing. nothing. No, nothing. So now we're wandering, we get, because we had to get out there. Now I'm wandering the docks, walking from boat to boat, talking to these skippers. And I finally, Rick Message, who ran the, who owned the Fierce Allegiance, he basically says, yeah, sure, come on, you can come with me. So we, we talk our way onto a boat. So How long are you gonna be on this boat? How long? Well, I figure we're gonna go on the boat for about three days. Because in that time, they're really plugging these boats. The, the season's a very short season because they're working 24 hours a day for like three, four straight days, plugging the boat, filling it with crab, and then coming in. Because it was at the time, it was just a derby, man. It's like, they said, you got, you got 90 million pounds of crab to catch, go get it. And 200 boats went to sea and every night, you put in your quota, so how much you caught, you caught and fishing game, and they say, okay, and the season's gonna end on Thursday at two o'clock, you know? So you're just, and so I go out to see with these guys. Little do I know though, that in, within 48 hours, we're gonna run into the worst storm in 40 years. That all of a sudden, this storm rolls in and the wind's pushing 70 knots. The waves are cresting at 40 feet, right? I mean, I think for sure we're all dead. Two boats sank to see that season. Seven guys drowned, never found the bodies, nothing. They were just gone. This is the kind of chaos that I was in. So, but all I could think of, and you want to talk about demented craziness. Now, again, I haven't slept for, I'm filming the entire time. I haven't slept for 48 hours and I'm working and I'm thinking, well, this boat's going to sink. We're all going to die. But I'm thinking this, this is my, this is my mind thinking. All right. So I'm going to take these meticulous notes. I got a little Pelican case like this. We're shooting, by the way, the cameras back then were high eight, Sony high eight cameras. So it's like these really, really rudimentary cameras. I burned through two Sony high eight cameras from the saltwater. Uh, I borrowed a little Sony mini cam from one of the crew members. I ended up getting an old VHS camera that we cabled to a VHS record unit and carried it because all the saltwater burned through all of our cameras and killed everything. You know, but we kept filming and I kept filming and I had this one camera up in a Pelican case sitting on up on a mast and I had a, and it had a battery that would only lasted two hours and I could put on the, on the, the Sony VX 1000, I could get a slow play, a slow record of a two hour record. So I'd have to climb that mast every two hours to change tapes and change batteries in the middle of this storm. The boat's wrecking, boof, boof. we're getting killed, but I'm, I had to have those cameras because that was the money shot right on the deck, right? So I mean, but then I'm so I'm filming, I'm taking these notes and I'm crazy out of my mind. So I, I think that here's the thing, I'm gonna take all my tapes, my high eight kit, my tapes, and I'm gonna put it in this Pelican case with the notes. And when the boat sinks, when I go overboard in my survival suit and if the water's 30 degrees and the waves are, and I'm dead for sure, but I'm gonna heave that case at the last minute, I'm gonna throw it overboard and I know the current travels south. So in my mind, as demented as it is at that point, I'm thinking that case is gonna float up on shore in Santa Monica two years later, 
and some little kid's gonna pick it up whose father is an Emmy award-winning film editor and producer and hand my case to them and say, Dad, look what I found, and my film would be made. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. But I tell you, so what? I get off that boat that, I, I, this is nuts, so I get it. So four or five, so we were out there for six days. And when I came out, I'll never forget it. When I got off that boat and I got on shore, I was feral. I'm telling, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I had turned into an animal. I didn't speak for the first day. I just growled. It was just like, I was so fucking crazy from this trip. I mean, it was, but it was like one of those most amazing, I, I, I saw the devil, I spit in his eye in the middle of this storm, you know what I mean? And I survived. It was like one of those incredible epiphanal moments. But the good side was that I took that material I, and, and went back to LA and I looked and I said, this is incredible material. And it's only supposed to be a 12 minute segment in a two hour show. So I'm like, fuck. so I, I, I cut some stuff together. I flew to DC and I sat down with the execs and said, you've got to look at this stuff. There's something here, there's something bigger. Give me, and I asked them at the time, I think 80,000 bucks. See, this is how you think, this is, this is thinking. I got, give me $80,000 and I'll make you another special. I'll shoot around that, I'll take this stuff, I'll make a special called The Deadliest Job in the World. So I did the two hour show, and then for 60,000 I made this other special. That special was the highest rated, the most profitable show in the history of the Discovery Channel, because every time it aired, it would pop a massive number. So that was my big break, that I got on that boat. That, by the way, my partner, Tom McMahon, at the time, um, he didn't want to get on that boat because he was worried he had kids and the whole thing. And by the way, I had a child too, but I got on that boat. And that's the difference between his career and mine, is that one choice. I chose to put it all on the line. I chose to risk my life, I mean everything, to do something that I really wanted to do and believed in. Was I scared to death? Absolutely. But you know, looking back, that was the big choice, the big decision I made. If I had stayed on shore, I don't think I'd be here today. Wow. That's a great story. Thank it you. Really is. So you sit here, you look back, you look at the younger version of you going, thank God I did that. It's crazy. Yeah. How often throughout your career have you done those crazy moments? Did you, was that the only one or were there other ones? No, no, no. Let me give you a little advice. You know, it's funny. All sorts, my career... As again, going back to mentors, I'm going to tell you a very funny Peter Gruber story. And John, by the way, everyone, I just want to let you know we will unmute you when you ask questions to Tom. Just hang on, we'll, I promise to get to you. Let's go to Peter Gruber. So, Gruber, so Gruber is one of my mentors, and I knew that him and when John Peters and him were together, they would uh, they would take good cop, bad cop. And John Peters, if they would go into the studio and they were fighting with an executive or budgets or whatever, John Peters was a crazy guy. And he would stand up on the guy's desk, literally, and scream at him and then storm out of the office. And then Peter Gruber would sit there very calmly and wait and then say, OK, before the crazy guy comes back, can we figure out something here? Can we work it out? And they would. But I didn't have a partner then. So I would go in to these meetings and I go screaming late about the budget I can't make this right and then I go like this okay before the crazy guy comes back <laughs> and I, I would play both roles <laughs> and I would literally say before the crazy guy comes back can we talk about this cop <laughs> so these guys all taught me you know great stuff but yeah I mean I took a lot of chances, every chance. The first show that I had after that, the, the Discovery came to me and they wanted me to make a show about Harley Davidson's because when I was at Turner Broadcasting, I had made it the history of Harley Davidson. So they wanted their own Harley show. Now here's another one. So I looked at it and said, you know what? I've already made a Harley show and that's not what's cool out there right now. What's really cool are choppers, all these, these you know, handmade, hand-built bikes. And so I went out looking and I found a guy named Jesse James in the little pissant motorcycle shop in down in Long Beach. And I remember this guy going, wow, he's incredibly charismatic, but he was poor as a church mouth, going through a divorce. He had nothing, but he had this incredible charisma. And so I basically baited and switched the Discovery Channel. So instead of making a documentary about Harley Davidson's. I made it about choppers and I made it this uh, a show with Jesse 
And that show was huge. And the network was so pissed off that there's, where's the Harleys? And I kept saying, well, they're all pieces in here, but this is, but, but I was right. I made a choice. I blindsided them with a film that, that was not what they were looking for, but it was better, way better. So I made that decision to put my career on the line. The second choice I made was when I created a show called Monster Garage. I put Jesse in it without network approval. I literally put him in the, a pilot episode. And I said, I'm telling you, this guy is unbelievably charismatic. So I created that show uh, and I stuck him in it and, and put my, risked my career on that too. So every time, you know, you got to be able to just look fear in the eye and just and take it down. I mean, that to me is the, the biggest hindrance is if you're afraid, not necessarily, I know that there's a whole fear of success stuff, but just fear, fear based, it gets you nowhere. You know, you gotta, you gotta fight through that fear and you gotta trust your gut and trust your instincts. Did you ever see uh, when JJ Abrams did his TED talk about the mystery box? About what? The mystery box. How he's got this box of magic that he got from his grandfather and he never wants to open up that mystery box. And in a lot of ways, Storage Wars was that mystery box, wasn't it? And, and yeah. that, that show, you can't know what's gonna happen. You, you never know what's gonna happen with it because it's a mystery box all the time, isn't it? That's what made it fun. But now, again, this is an interesting story. I, went, I set out to make a show, you know those 1-800-GOT-JUNK? trucks yeah, all over town, right? Business. right so i was always fascinated about what those one eight of what they did so i reached out to the ceo of the company and i said look i want to put a film crew on one of your trucks for a week just to see what and see if there's something there so they bring back the footage after a week and it, and then i'm looking at the footage i'm like oh god it's just like a bunch of hoarders and you know there's not really a lot of cool stuff there but four three times that week they stopped by an, a storage place and they were cleaning up after an auction. And I'm like, what is this? They're like, well, it's this weird auction where they just, you're not allowed to go in and people bid on the stuff. And then if it's usually a lot of crap and then they call us and we go and we empty it out and we pay for, you know, and, and, and we, we get rid of their stuff. They pay us to get rid of the stuff. So now I'm like, whoa, what do you mean? So I start going to the auctions. Nobody knows who I am. I start bidding on stuff. I'm buying lockers. I'm getting at the whole time. This goes on for about three weeks. And the whole time I'm casting the show. All those guys that you see in the show are were they were there at those auctions. And I cast them because I could see there was this lot, a lot of acrimony. There was a lot of, you know, these guys, nobody liked each other. But the wild card, the interesting thing, and Jeff Conroy, my partner, also you gotta be always willing to listen to somebody else's advice too, if they've got good ideas. And a lot of people do. And Jeff Conroy said to me, he was a kid at work for most of my partner at the time. And he said, you know, do you ever think about, you know, Barry Weiss? Because Barry was the wild card. Barry was a guy that I put in storage wars that would never, he used to sell, you know, um, antiques and stuff, but he never was in that business. And I put him in it. And that was the secret sauce that made that show really fly, is the idea that I had this great backdrop. It was a treasure hunt. As you said, you never knew what you were going to get. But at the same time, really witty and clever repartee, you know, that's what carried it. The humor is what carried that show. It was one of the first half hour reality sitcoms out there for men. Yeah. But I think you told me either it was the third or fourth season, you seem to always see this ego happen with the people that are in it. Is it the third or fourth season? Which one is it? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, yeah, I got a real theory, and it, it plays out. It's the fourth season. Fourth season. Yeah, because here's how it goes. First season, every one of these kind of reality stars um, are they're all just amazed that they're on television. They can't believe it. They're getting calls from their friends and family, going, "This is awesome. You're awesome." And then second second season, they're amazed that they're on a hit television show because it's been picked up. So they're just thrilled to death that they're on a hit TV show, but then their mind starts going, where's my money? If they're making money, where's my money? So season three, you agree, okay, usually there's a big negotiation there and you gotta give them a lot more money, but they're never happy with the money you give them. And so season four is about rounding it up, 
and making sure they get what they want. But right at that moment, something else happens. And that is they realize that people are recognizing them on the street, that they're famous, they're buying them dinner, they're being, they're being uh, invited to drive the pace car at the Indianapolis 500. They're being paid 30,000, 40,000 bucks to open a fish market in Peoria. You know, all of a sudden fame has taken over and fame is carrying them beyond the television show. So that's, if you can get there, then from then on, I mean, I'm in season 16 with Deadliest Catch, season 10, and I got no problems anymore because they all get the joke. They understand and they're all making money, but they also, their, their lives have changed dramatically. Well, that's why we see season five, they're generally not there anymore. <laughs> Some of them aren't, and I'm not afraid. Unlike, you know, I, you learn from stuff too, if you're smart. And when, I, when Jersey Shore came out and they started basically going on strike and getting snooky, getting all that money, you know, she was getting 50,000 bucks in an ensemble show, a show. And it was like, it was called Snooky Money. And I went, look, guys, don't be afraid to recast. And from very beginning, I would recast a boat every year at Deadly's Catch. You know, so if somebody wanted to play hardball and wanted to go on a strike, strike and I go, fine, I'll replace you. So you, they couldn't, you know, you couldn't let, so you can't, you know, you want to be fair with those guys. But what they didn't realize, and this is the one that always sticks in my head, they don't realize that I never once renegotiated a contract. My deal was my deal. So in Deadliest Catch, yeah, I got a hit television show. You know what I got the next year? I got a 5% bump. That's what I got. When they're getting 100%, 200% raises, I got 5%. Year three, I got five more percent. Now, don't get me wrong. You make your money in the cracks. And this is the smart thing everybody realized. I didn't make any more money uh, from the show than my 5% increase. But I negotiated ratings bonuses. I negotiated one thing, which was the best of all, that cost the, the network absolutely nothing. Canada or uh, Alaska had initiated the tax credits. So I said, look, let me keep the tax credits. You know, it, it, it doesn't show up on your, 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 your sheets. It doesn't show up on anything, but it's something that I can do and, and, and it won't affect you guys at all. So they let me do it because again, it was a huge hit series, which it still is, but that turned into, you know, almost 2 million bucks a year, you know, in tax credits. So that was, that was the big change. And the other one I was going to tell you guys, and then I'll take questions or whatever. When you have a business, Ted Turner taught me something really important. He said, look, Tom, he says, you don't just make money on the television show. He said, he said, I look at a TV show like I look at a cow. And the idea is to make money on every piece of that cow, including the moo. That's what he would say. That you had a, so so in other, you're looking at vertically integrated opportunities. So you always are looking for what else is an opportunity to make money. Now for me, I started a music publishing company, you know, uh, and back then Discovery didn't even have one. So I kind of got a jump and, I, and they realized that my shows were special also because I had really unique scores. I wasn't using needle drop that everybody else was using. And so it really stuck, but that owning that music publishing company with two employees, I made over a million and a half bucks a year on that music publishing company in royalties. So that's what you got to do because you know, they're squeezing the hell out of everything. And I, I imagine in every business, your margins are getting tight. So it's like, where else is there an opportunity to make money? That is always the big thing for me. And you probably saw, and you did see it because I forwarded it to you, you saw that uh, Survivor is not, did not make this new season coming up. It's not going to be on television because they can't shoot it. Yeah, uh, they can't shoot it. I mean, you know, that's, that's been a big, uh, you know, problem for a lot of uh, companies. I mean, but it's interesting. I just talked to Rob Sherno, who run, runs A&E and History Channel the other day. He was telling me that, you know, they were smart enough, and a lot of these guys were, I didn't really anticipate this, but they knew that ad sales dumped on uh, the first and second quarter. The ad sales guys really stopped buying. And if you look at massive markets that, that you know, the, your major drivers in television and in, in, in advertising, the airlines, where the hell are they gone? There's no airline. Movies, you know, big uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday buys, you know, gone. You know, you've got the, the entire travel industry, hotel gone. industries, you know, gone, gone. Cars, you know, nobody's buying a new car in the middle of this craziness. So in essence, all of your major advertisers, boom, they disappeared. So these guys, 
they pulled back all their original inventory and they're just running reruns and they're waiting for this to, you know, so smartly enough, they've got product, but right now they're just sitting it out. All right, let's take some questions. Let's first go to um, Michael K. Michael Kliski, you want to say something to Mr. Tom Beers? Hey, Tom. Good to see you again. You too, Mike. How you doing, man? Good, good. Yeah, um, last time Tom and I saw each other in person, it was in San Miguel de Allende for Dia de los Muertos. Oh, you went down to Tom's place. You went to the Three Beers? Yeah, yeah. Amazing place. Amazing place. And, and Tom's very generous to you know, host my friends and I at his place in his, uh, in his uh, spa. I think you guys ended up in the hot tub that night, didn't you? Uh, yeah, that could happen. I think it was one of those one of those clothing optional hot tubs. I think it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was it was a fun trip. But um, yeah, I was just uh, uh, touch base with you because um, you know now that COVID's hit, uh, how are you got how are you handling the production of that? And remember, you know, we spoke a few years ago about sustainability and production. And now seems like a really good time, as much as it may intuitively seem like a bad time, to reset the way we do business so that we can look at it to be not only safer, but also more sustainable. Well, you know, I agree with you. And I think that the, the window will open. I think there's going to be two steps. So I think first is just get the doors open, you know, and then start to really, because I think that there is, a, you know, if there's any upside to this whole thing, it is people exploring and re-examining, you know, what's important. You know, and, you know, and so I'm seeing this morning, I was reading again that, you know, yesterday was, you know, that global warming is just going to be more devastating than ever, you know, but I think that the key to it is it's, I understand what you're saying, boots on the ground, let's, you know, change our, you know, our production habits, but it's really the messaging that's way more important than that. And that is getting the messaging out through programming, you know, and the people, you know, kind of doing the right thing, you know, I'm, you're kind of seeing a little bit of that. And I think that the millennials are, are, are actually having a, a strong effect on that as well. So hopefully we'll all get there. I mean, I, you know, I, I wish I would have the luxury right now of, of making any of those adaptations. Hell, I mean, but there's, you know, production still shut down. I mean, I've got one show, my show with Sully uh, on a CBD farm and only because we shot it last year. So we're, Well, you know, Sully's also been driving around shooting it too. He's been good. Yeah, yeah, I know. He's diligent. I love selling. I like the product, by the way. He sent me some. That stuff is really good. Yeah, Montush, baby. Montush. Really good. Let's go to Kira. Kira, your question for Tom. Yeah. Hey, Tom. Um, this is amazing. I do a lot of little um, documentaries. I love the observational documentary term because that's pretty much like been my world with these little projects. And the I loved your Pelican case story, too, because uh, of, of it showing up on the shore because I literally worked on a project where a, a woman showed up with three suitcases full of DV tapes and said, my brother died four years ago. Here's 10 years of his life leading up to his death. Can you make a film out of this? And we spent several years on that project. It's getting finished now, but that does happen. It has Tom, happened. Tom's actually seen Be Brave. Oh, he has. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Mickey and I worked on, like, we edited that thing for years. It is getting yeah. finished now, which is great. It's, it's, where's it, it's where's it getting released? It was terrific. I saw that. Yeah, the sister, Erin, who originally brought us the footage, she has a producer um, who's working on it right now. And they're, oh, yeah, hopefully this, probably next year it'll be out. But I want well, you to- You know what's nice about that piece? It's timeless, you know? It doesn't matter, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to share on that, like, you know, user-generated content. Um, everything's shut down right now. One project that I've been working on and I'm just really loving how like, um, you know, effortless it's been is there's this app called Marco Polo. I don't know if you've used it, but it's a video messaging app that a lot of families use to keep in touch with the grandparents and stuff like that. And you can only leave video messages and it's private. So you set up a little group with like uncles and aunts and everything. I've been in this group with 12 guys right before 2020, we started it leading up to Christmas. And so far in that group alone, there's a hundred hours of content, you know, our wishes for 2020, a guy gave birth to, his wife gave birth to twins. There's been deaths in the family. It's like this archive of what it is to be a man. It's all men in 2020. And every week it's just naturally generating hours of, of dialogue and stuff like that. And I only share that as an example because um, I feel like 
a lot of the projects I'm looking at now, I'm looking at ways like that to create content, like basically set up the set up the foundation for people to film themselves, put together some kind of narrative and then edit it together. Well, I, I think it's a, it's a great idea. You know, it's, it's funny because I'm, I'm trying to make that transition in my head now uh, in my life I, I, from uh, commercial television to what I consider art, you know, uh, which basically means that nobody's really paying for it. And it's just, I'm, I'm, you know, I've made four feature docs in the last couple of years and, you know, there's no money in that, but it's just a passion projects. Um, and I think what you're talking about, I mean, I love to see what you can do with that. And ultimately the cream rises, you know, and if that show, if it's really good, it may find an audience someplace else. I'm just not really familiar now with the, distribution opportunities out there. I mean, it's just changed so dramatically and it's so fragmented. I don't really understand any of that new market. Uh, but obviously something like this, you know, I'd be very happy if you just want to shoot me something and I'd be happy to take a look at it and steer you some direction in regards to editorial. I just, you know, I'm just, I, I haven't figured out distribution quite yet. Fair yeah, enough. no, that's, that's great. I, can I add one more thing, Ken? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I'd love to do that. I wasn't even requesting that, but I'd be honored to, to share it once I've edited something. And, I, you know, along the lines of like what Michael was asking, I had a friend who was an editor on Deadliest Catch years mm -hmm. back, and he said the way he described their editing process, it was as if he was working for NASA or something. He's like, there's a hundred cameras, you make a request based on time and date, and they, they will send you a clip and it just sounded so incredibly just crazy and dynamic. Can you do that remotely now? Like, is there some automated way to capture without being in person, having a crew? Cause it seems like you've been doing that way before we had to do that. Yeah. It's funny. Cause yeah, all, we, all we're doing now is just making the cable stretch farther. You know, I mean, um, that's all it is. We, we've moved the editors. Uh, they're all, you know, remote. But all the ISIS, all the material is still in, in big editing, uh, you know, massive towers. And yeah, we day and date time sync everything uh, early on because when you're shooting, you know, you remember, you know, normally it's funny in a feature film, you're shooting about four to one, uh, maybe six to one you're shooting. And in reality docs, um, like the BBC used to love to shoot at 20 to one when they were shooting film and documentaries like a 20 to one uh, ratio. Uh, our, most docs right now are shot, like our, our special stuff is shot around 50 to one, 50 hours for every hour that goes on the air. But Deadliest Catch is 400 to one. You know, and it always has been because we've got all these deck cams running 24 hours because, you know, again, you don't know what's gonna happen. So uh, a lot of that stuff just gets heaved because it's just nothing happening. But yeah, so you had to figure out early how do we, how do we digitize all this massive amount of material, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and you're, you're taking it very low res because you've got so much material and having going back to that source material. So yeah, very early on, we figured how to time sync and time date everything, you know, and then you're dealing with the red cameras or a lot of other technologies that didn't sync up to that either. So, you know, and working with crystal sync and, you know, you, you, you the sound is, I mean, it's a, a lot of stuff technical, pro technically problematic, but we kind of figured all that out. I mean, and any boat on the crab and Dudley's Catch, we have probably almost, I think the last time I heard it was like 3,000 feet of, of cable on any one boat. No. That's crazy. Okay, let's go to uh, Scott. Scott, your question for Tom. I didn't necessarily have a question. I just had a comment. I, I just want to tell you that Jared from Storage Wars uh, is the owner. He took that money and he bought a bar down here in Lake Forest, California. And my band plays that bar. And uh, Jared's a lot, a lot of fun. But uh, life after reality TV is that he's a, a bar a, a bar owner and he and he has bands like mine come and entertain the people. But it's a lot of fun. He's, he's a cool How's guy. he doing down there? Is he good? He's doing good. Yeah, he's he's doing he's doing good. You know, bars are closed, but he's finding ways to. You know, uh, you know, serve people out in the parking lot. Anything he, he serves food too, so he's trying to keep his business, uh, you know, afloat. It's tough for any bar owner. It's right a tough now. business, by the way. You know, I got to tell you, I, you know, I yeah. was with a friend of mine yesterday. who owns a, a couple of uh, restaurants and bars over on Franklin, over in West Hollywood. And it's just, it's uh, North Hollywood, and it's just a mess. I mean, you know, he really yeah. thinks that it's going to take years 
for those to come back that you know that the the local pubs and bars are just you know they're 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 dinosaurs and they're not going to come back you know I, I don't know if you guys realize this but it's like he was telling me that eating habits have changed a lot ever since uh you've got those uh takeout delivery food delivery systems uh and also uh the new dating apps so people now young millennials are literally just dating apps come on to my house let's have dinner have grubhub drop some food off I don't know, drop, you know, knock some boots for a couple of hours and then just go away. It's just changed the entire social structure as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, maybe you can do another show with Jared about uh, how it keeps his bar afloat, you know, something. <laughs> He's down in Lake Forest if you need him. <laughs> All right, give my love. Right on. All right. Can I ask a question? Yeah, let's I let me, question. No, 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 we're going in order, guys. Hang on. Okay. I didn't mean to mute Tom. Hang on, Tom. I didn't mean to mute you, sir. All right, let's go over to Nick. Nick, go for it. What's your question, Nick? Hey, what's up? Hey, Tom, I'm excited to uh, uh, see you here. Thanks for spending some time. Uh, so I noticed uh, that my kids and all their friends, they spend hours and hours and hours watching footage of other kids playing video games <laughs> like on YouTube and stuff. So a few months ago, my kids and I put together a few pilot episodes of a show of them playing some retro Nintendo games and lots of like conflict interactions between them with like interviews, you know, around it and stuff. Um, it, it's a lot of fun. People have really liked the concept and stuff. I'm curious who we should be showing it to to get this picked up and developed. Well, you know, I, I think probably your best is to uh, look at the Turner Broadcasting Group. You know, they've mm -hmm. got that whole Turner Esports uh, and, um, you know, there's a, a, it's a big growth opportunity there. So if it's funny enough, and clever enough, uh, probably uh, I'd go to um, True, which is on, you know, it's the Turner Group, True, True TV, because okay. they're, they're doing a lot of, uh, of comedy stuff. That would be my first thought. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Nick. Let me go over to, I guess I'm just following the orders in which you guys ask questions inside the chat. So I'm going to go to Harry. Harry, you got the mic. Let's go for Harry. Okay. <clears throat> Hey, Tom, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, uh, my question to you is about, we do so many great shows, but they seem to be very neat oriented, you know, Whisper Wars or Garage Wars. Um, and, and, and to your earlier comment about uh, getting old, which I can relate to, I, I work with a lot of young, talented people, but they don't have enough caves on the planet. And is what we tell them. And uh, because your experience with theater and then news and entertainment and story and, and it is is so necessary and so vast. Uh, what I'm interested in is: Are you doing anything that's a, more of an epic, more complex story as opposed to to niche? Because uh, we see an opportunity with the the technology changing so fast and the new way to create and consume content. There's a new narrative that mixes great storytelling with user-generated content. Are you doing anything in those spaces? You know, I, I, as I said earlier, I, I wish I was, but I don't have that knowledge base of distribution. I mean, I, it, all day long, I, I, I'd love to do that. But I got to be honest as well. You know, the other things at my age, again, uh, I'm, I'm way more interested also in the, the, the rest of the world. You know, I, I, I made a lot of investments in beverage companies. Uh, I owned a piece of big piece of Kavita, you know, uh, I, so in core water. So I'm, I'm interested in that. I'm, I'm an art collector. So I'm interested in, in you know, in, in the life of artists and art. You know, I, I just, I, I'm real commercial real estate. So I'm doing a lot of other different things. I'm not delving that deep into it's too mystifying for me and i don't know how to demystify the, the again I, I i understand how to make shows i just don't really understand the distribution models anymore that 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 pay any money i certainly understand free you know uh but it's really uh and, and i look at the fragmentation of my markets again i'm a I'm a cable guy. I mean, I ran Fremantle, so I also did America's Got Talent, American Idol, X Factor, uh, you know, Let's Make It Infinite, Celebrity Family Feud. I did all those big shows for when I was running uh, Fremantle. And uh, I understand that network model, I understand the cable model, but now I don't understand the kind of the, the Netflix or even the, the, the Twitter models or the Facebook models. 
those are all new models. And uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm sadly mystified and I, I'd rather focus my energies elsewhere. <laughs> that makes sense. Interesting. Well, and also you mentioned sell the whole cow, including the move. The moo. I think there are monetization models that, uh, that we should talk about, but, th but thank you for, uh, for yeah, yeah, no, look, I, I always look at that. I mean, I, every show, I mean, Monster Garage is a perfect example of that. I mean, I had, die, we, at one time we were doing die cast models, collectibles. I was doing, you know, so, software, plush. I mean, it was incredible. I had over, I think, 75 uh, Monster Garage licenses for, for merchandise and publishing, you know, music, did soundtrack, albums. I mean, so I, you really, there's massive opportunities, but it's what I'm, what I'm saying about it, the fragmented market. I don't, you know, when you've got influencers, you know, like the Kardashian kid, that's just making a billion dollars on cosmetics. I mean, they've, 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 they've gone right by, they've leapt by all the technologies that I know, you know, to get there. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, when you watch these kids today and millennials, to, you know, I've got a real theory on concept on this. When you watch in the high arts disappear, opera, ballet, the symphony, which, by the way, I didn't really give a shit about anyway. But I mean, the, the, the point is that those, those audiences are dying off and these new user generated opportunities are happening, you know, it, but it's the cost of those high arts, which is sad for me because that to me was special. So it's like, again, it's just an evolution and it's moving so fast. And these guys, they, they think so quickly and they're so versatile in, in their, their thought processes and in living processes that it's just hard for me to keep up. Yeah, so one last comment, Ken, if I could go for her. Uh, yeah, Tom, what I was gonna say is that data is the new oil, right? Yeah. That's where, that's where uh, I think the money lies. And I, I did not like reality TV when it first came out. I was a, a mm -hmm. part of this, but you changed that. Uh, and, and it was at the Metal Talk when, when you mentioned your mentors that I thought, no wonder uh, Tom, Tom gets it at that level. And story, I appreciate uh, that. Storytelling is, is the way. So uh, uh, once again, thank you, man. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Let's go to James. King James. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Tom and, uh, and Ken as well. Uh, very impressed with your Captain Scarlet uniform today. Thunderbirds are go. Um, Tom, uh, thank you, really appreciate you sharing your lessons and principles um, and pearls of wisdom. Um, you seem to epitomize the, uh, you know, the Bob Dylan quote when he said, some people feel the rain, others just get wet. You really, you really get in there. And, uh, you know, so my question- I don't know, but I'd love to play that drum set behind you. <laughs> great, you're welcome anytime in the, in, in the virtual world, everything is real. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to ask you, really, is, is there a, a great story that you've yet to tell? You know, I'm working on a book now, uh, and there are, you know, three or four stories that, I, that always kind of s stick in my head that, you know, I, I really wouldn't talk about now. But, yeah, there are some really fun and unique and interesting stories that luckily I was in the middle of that I could, you know, I was there, you know, and so I, uh, it's, yeah, yeah, there, there, there are, there are many, thank you. I love hearing that. James, thanks a lot. Let me go to our last question. Last question is gonna come from Brad. Brad, you got Mr. Beer's ear, go for it. Hey, thank you. Um, so I had a, a couple things. One is regarding the, uh, the music publishing company you had and stuff, I was just wondering more about that and how you worked with the composers. I've done like Extreme Makeover, Super Nanny, Deal or No Deal, a bunch of shows. So I'm yeah. wondering what advice you have for music and composers or how you see getting back into that, especially with COVID and everybody stopping production. And then well, the other question was American Farmer. I was just wondering whatever happened with that show you were talking about at one point. But you, know, you know, I'll answer the first, the second question first. Uh, we made it, we did a, uh, an eight, eight hour series on uh, the History Channel and it just, it launched with a thud. It was, it was, it's just heartbreaking again to watch what's happening in the world of cable. Um, it was a beautiful show, well-crafted, great stories. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 again, the playing field has changed. Uh, the networks have given up because of financial constraints, have given up launching primetime original programming first run programming at eight o'clock. So they've taken all, they're all repeats now at eight o'clock yeah. and all of their originals are at nine. 
But in order to launch a new series, they, they, their theory is to launch it off the backs of an original. So it's a 10 o'clock launch. You can't launch a family program at 10 o'clock. And it just, and we got no promotion, absolutely no. They had no money. We put it out. It, it was just a, a nightmare and a sad story. But again, I'm not bemoaning and I'm very proud of the work. Uh, but it just, you know, it didn't go anywhere. The other question, and by the way, you were talking earlier, it's like I had done a deal with the Farm Aid guys. We we're going to do live concerts. There was a million things that we could have done with Farm if the show had taken off. But uh, in, in the cable industry, the last big show that's actually been a hit is Naked and Afraid, and that's almost five years old. So nothing is really kept grabbing the attention. And I think, again, I'll, I want to go back to something. Uh, my, my theory is that to the millennials and the younger audiences, which is so important to the growth or the continued growth of the, the industry, they have changed the, their complete structures or viewing habits. To them, a reality show is, uh, is Instagram and Snapchat. You know, they've created their own tribes, you know, and, and you know, so they communicate through, through that. So their consumption, media consumption has changed. They're not watching television anymore. They're watching, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, TikTok. And so they're, they're taking all that time that used to be for television and they're watching that. And they're also very spoiled by, uh, by uh, you know, Netflix and just basically binging. So the, the, the habits change. Going back to your story about uh, composers, my son is working now with a composer. They're all working remotely. He's doing music for uh, the New Jersey Shore reboot and uh, Life Below Zero. Um, but he works with Jonathan Miller, composer. And so, you know, my, my advice is just twofold. I mean, you seem to be obviously doing very well. Congratulations. You know, it's all about relationships and, and past. And I, I understand that there was a time recently that, uh, that Discovery tried to take away all the music publishing from uh, composers. Were you involved in that at all? Yeah, and also they tried to take the writers too for a while. I think a few of them yeah. were trying to take the writers. Yeah, they try to take the writers. They take to, They try to do a buyout and, and basically hold on right. to all those rights because they're looking for other opportunities as well. So, um, sorry, I just went off a minute. Anyway, that it's uh, it, it's a, it's not a bad time for composers. It's just you know I know that they're going to keep chipping away at that. They're going to try and look at that because of all the industries. I got to be honest with you. I think that the music industry they're very smart. And they, they got away with murder because I don't get, I, I narrate a hundred shows a year. I don't get royalties. <clears throat> I don't get residuals off of that. You know, I, and most of the other industries don't get, and for some reason, the artist, the, the, the music artist has managed to still continue to, to, to do that. <clears throat> now I do know that the sacrifices early on where the license fees became, you know, or are actually paying uh, the, the, the composers, you know, went down by three, you know, almost 70%. And so composers were making a lot less because they relied on that back end money. And yeah. then when you start taking away the back end money, you know, you're going to hear them, you know, make a lot of noise. And I don't blame them. When I heard that Discovery was doing that, I was stunned. I'm like, God, don't you realize that they already squeezed the crap out of the front end of this process. Now you're trying to kill the back end too. You know, where are you going to go? And then all of a sudden originality and, you know, score music and sound is so important to these shows. And so, you know, I, I back the composers all the way. And is any thought you have moving forward, like where to reach out or where, to, how to? You know, again, it's just all weirdly enough. I mean, everybody's got their, seems to have their tribes, you know? I mean, I work with probably five, five or six different composers and, you know, I love working with them. I mean, over the trial and error, I probably work with 20, but it's down to five or six and each one of them have kind of a specialty. So it really becomes almost a farm system. I, I don't know how to break through there, you know, until somebody else, you know, you've got out of the way or you just, it's all about relationships, man. And, and that's the key. I mean, I don't think I listened once to somebody's reel. I, what I did do is this though. I reached out three or four times and I've worked with them on composers that I was impressed by their music on somebody else's show. I said, you know, I, I want to talk to that guy. I like what he's done or what she's done. So that, that really is, you know, your big calling card is, is your work product. So everyone, please unmute yourself and let's thank Tom Beers for joining us today, everyone. Tom, thank you so much. And uh, I really appreciate you giving us time and being such a great metal member. I mean, you've been here since 2008. So thank you so much. Tom, thank you, Tom. Bye, Tom. Bye, Tom. Bye, everyone. Bye, -bye you guys. Bye, Thanks all. so much. Bye.